Hello. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the 25th anniversary New York City Book Awards presented by the New York Society Library. I'm Katie Freakis. I work in the events office and closely with the New York City Book Awards jury. I would like to welcome all of our distinguished guests, winners, and viewers tonight, and to introduce our head librarian, Carolyn Waters. Thank you, Katie. And welcome everybody to the New York Society Library's 25th New York City Book Awards celebration. Some of you may have only recently learned about the existence of the library, which always surprises me considering we have made our home here in New York City for the past 267 years. As the oldest library and cultural institution in the city, I think that we are uniquely qualified to recognize the best books of literary quality or historical importance that evoke the spirit or enhance appreciation of New York City. At this time, I wanna congratulate all of the winners uh, on your extraordinary achievement. I would also like to express my deep appreciation and admiration for our New York City Book Award jury members, most particularly our 2020 jury chair, Bianca Calabresi and 2019 chair, Warren Wexler. Under their stellar leadership, the jury members spent countless hours reading and considering hundreds of books to narrow them down to these few winners. Thanks to Katie Freakas, who you just met for her exceptional support as our staff liaison to the jury. Thanks also to Jenny Lawrence for making possible the Hornblower Award, now in its 10th year, for the best New York City related book by a first time author. And now I'd like to call Ellen Eisman to the virtual podium. Ellen has been a New York Society Library trustee for more than 10 years, and we are extraordinarily grateful to her for her long time and generous support of the New York City Book Awards. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and welcome everyone near and far. I'm Ellen Eisman, a longtime member of the board of the library and a sponsor for almost a decade of the library's New York City Book Awards. The awards now are in their 25th anniversary year. 2021 also marks the 10th anniversary of the Hornblower Award given to distinguished first time authors. I'm always happy to make these introductory remarks. The awards celebrate my hometown of many generations at a time especially when New York needs uplifting and salute committed writers who have produced inspired works. Books have always been a source of solace and distraction, of course, but for me during this pandemic, they have served to take me to a different place, a kind of path out of darkness into the light. To shine a light more brightly on the prize winners, here is Bianca Calabresi, the chair of the 2020 New York City Book Awards. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. It's my great pleasure to acknowledge the members of the 2021, 2020-2021 jury and to say a few words about their, the unusual circumstances of this year's award process. But first, it's an honor to introduce Warren Wexler, who will himself speak in just a few minutes and to thank him for his remarkable service as chair of the jury from 2016 through 2020, and especially his calm and measured leadership of the 2019-2020 jury process. His is the only committee on which I've served where the chair frequently ran the meeting in black tie and opera slippers. Perhaps it was the dinner jacket, but Warren made the role seem so effortless that I confess I was a little shocked to find out just how much work he had been doing all these years. His fair-minded, deeply knowledgeable, and succinct assessments will remain a model for all of us, as will his generous, self-effacing chairmanship, his austere-like elegance, and his gentle wit. Thank you so much, Warren. And now from opera slippers to just slippers. This year's committee met entirely by Zoom 
And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the extra challenge it presented for our jurors, not only to meet virtually, but also to obtain and read the nominations remotely. Thank you jurors. And thank you to all the staff at the library and especially Katie Freakus for superhuman logistical support, new ways of online access and cheerful alacrity wherever they happen to be. This year's jury members, Jesse Alvarez, Nikhil Iyengar, Anita Kapadia, Christine Kendall, Tracy Kwan, Liz Robbins, and Justin Zarembi made the jury process virtual and remote only in a technical sense. Their heroic evaluations of hundreds of submissions, their enthusiasm for the many, many exceptional candidates, and their literary fellowship throughout this painful year embody the actual and present power of reading accounts of hardship and joy, past and present, together. I will let them speak for themselves as they always do so well. First, Christine Kendall to introduce 2020-2021 award winner, Johanna Fernandez. Thanks, Bianca. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Johanna Fernandez, author of The Young Lords, A Radical History. Professor Hernandez's book traces the rise and fall of this underappreciated political organization that burst onto the social justice scene in the late 1960s. Made up of mostly poor and working class young activists, predominantly Puerto Rican, but also African American, the young lords loved their communities deeply and fought against poverty and discrimination. And as the children of the massive post-World War II migration of Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans to New York, the young lords also challenged American foreign policy, specifically U.S. imperialism in Puerto Rico. Over the course of their brief lifespan, the young lords won significant reforms. For instance, in 1974, the Young Lords led the garbage and lead offensives that pressured local government into passing legislation to protect New York City residents from lead poisoning. Professor Hernandez's beautifully written book offers profound insights into the group based on her meticulous research, including oral histories, archival records, and New York Police Department surveillance files, which she only gained access to after successful lawsuit. The book has received three of the Organization of American Historians top prizes, including the prestigious Frederick Jackson Turner Award. Dr. Fernandez is an associate professor at Baruch College, where she teaches 20th century US history and the history of social movements. She has received numerous honors, including a Fulbright and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. She has appeared in print, on radio, as well as on television, including Al Jazeera, NPR, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. We thank Professor Hernandez for her excellent work by presenting her with this award. Okay, this came at me fast. <laughs> First of all, I wanna thank the committee, the jurors for uh, reading this, this labor of love. Um, and I wanna thank Christine for her uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I learned about the Young Lords when I was coming of age politically in college. Uh, and anyone who comes across the story is mesmerized. The Young Lords took over a church in East Harlem and transformed it into a sanctuary for the poor. They occupied a hospital in the Bronx to dramatize the horrific conditions of health under which Black Americans and Puerto Ricans uh, were, were being given health care. They drafted, along with hospital workers and doctors, the first known patient Bill of Rights. They exposed childhood lead poisoning in the city and forced the mayor, through their direct action, to pass um, anti-lead poisoning legislation and formed for the first time the Bureau of Lead Poisoning. 
They did so many things. Um, they were fierce. They were courageous. They were determined to civilize our society. I then wrote this book, and the book is also about New York. It's about how New York became a majority minority city, one populated mostly by people of color, uh, Black Americans and Latinos in particular. It's also about the transformation of the economy of New York in this period and the rise of deindustrialization and permanent unemployment among these new migrants. It's also about how Puerto Rico became a colony of the United States. It's about the struggle against racism in this country uh, and in New York and the fight against police brutality. And it's about so much more. Um, no speech could, could really give um, the history that the young lords made um, its due. I just want to end by saying that um, there are echoes of the young lords and their fierce determination to transform society everywhere in America and beyond. We see it in the Black Lives Matter movement. We see it in Chile. We see it in the uprisings in, uh, in Colombia. We see it in Palestine. Uh, we see it in Turkey. And I wrote this book for those with the courage to fight for humanity's highest aspirations uh, and remake society anew. And this is really the moment for it. I, I, this is like the first award ceremony that I'm participating in live. Uh, and I'm from New York. So this is like an extra gift, really. Um, that this kid from the Bronx is acknowledged by the New York Society Library, the oldest library uh, in New York City. Uh, words uh, are everything to me. I'm the child of immigrants. I, I uh, was born and raised uh, here in New York City, but English was my second language because my parents didn't speak English. And so I had all of this trouble with language and and clarity and words and deep meaning and root causes are the reasons why I wrote this book. So thank you so very much for, um, for reading it because it's not a short book and for helping me amplify the incredible story of the Young Lords. And of course, here's to the incredible history the Young Lords made. Thank you again. The Young Lords was an extraordinary work. Uh, it's my great pleasure now uh, to introduce Bill Hayes, the author of How We Live Now, Scenes from the Pandemic. The history of the pandemic will be written and rewritten. The shock of the unfamiliar, the fear of disease, the ways in which experience became local even as the threat was global. These are the themes that will be explored by historians, sociologists, novelists, and playwrights. In time, distance may bring objectivity, but we remain in a moment of first impressions and reaction. Bill Hayes's marvelous book, How We Live Now, Scenes from the Pandemic, is a prolonged reflection on how the pandemic changed lives and place. Like his 2017 book, Insomniac City, How We Live Now can rightly be described as a love letter to the city. Hayes captures it in photographs and words. He finds the rhythms of New York in the chance encounter, the sudden glimpse, the friendly neighborhood, the excitement of discovery, and the sadness of loss. But where Insomniac City explored love and loss in a city at its peak, how we live now explores a city in seeming stasis, where silence and isolation have replaced the bombast of urban life. Yet even as he reflects on the strangeness of 2020, Hayes captures the beauty that remains amidst fear, illness, and uncertainty. It is so quiet, Hayes writes, you can hear a bird singing. You can hear a baby crying. You can hear a single voice rising up from 8th Avenue. You can hear a bus idling near Horatio. You can hear a conversation under my window. You can hear a guy at a gas pump talking on his cell phone. You can hear a kid on a scooter in the park. You can hear a person with a walker walking, the walker scraping the sidewalk. You can hear a madman ranting and raving somewhere. You can hear someone hammering, 
something someplace uptown. You can hear delivery, gal, be, delivery guy's bike bells. You can hear someone whistling as he walks. You can hear yourself crying by yourself. Bill Hayes has collected for us what was heard and unheard at the height of the pandemic. And in doing that, he reflects on the vitality of New York. In one scene, he describes going to a restaurant he loves, which like so many restaurants, risked closure. The owner, Joe, had laid off all of his staff and Hayes describes going into the restaurant one night to pick up an order. Joe offered him a drink, illicitly given, uh, illicitly given the prohibition on indoor dining. Hayes writes, he poured two glasses and stepped back while I retrieved one for myself. We raised our glasses to one another. Here's to New York, Hayes said. Here's to New York, Joe said. We drank a glass and talked from either end of the bar. As we gather tonight, still separate but feeling closer than ever, in a city that feels more alive every day, we honor Bill Hayes for that eloquent toast and a book which is itself a toast to the city that he and all of us love. Here's to Bill Hayes. Here's to New York Society Library and the jurors and my fellow winners. I'm, um, I'm so touched. Justin, thank you for that beautiful introduction. You read one of my favorite passages in the book about the silence of the city a year ago. I'm, I'm, I'm just so touched to get this award. And um, it was a labor of love and also a gift, a gift from my longtime editor, Nancy Miller, who's edited all of my books. And uh, in mid-March of last year, she contacted me for a Zoom meeting and I'd never heard of Zoom. It was my first Zoom meeting. I had no idea why. And it was her idea for me to write and photograph a book about this pandemic, which was approaching our shores like a tsunami. And um, the whole idea from the beginning was really to capture the first 100 days of the pandemic here in New York. And of course, immediately I said yes. Um, it was a great gift. It also kept me from climbing the walls here in my apartment as I immersed myself in writing and photographing this book. Um, and it was a very pandemic experience working on the spot with my editor uh, as I worked on the book over a very short two month period. Nancy's amazing. The whole team at Bloomsbury is amazing. Thank you to Patty Ratchford who did the striking cover and the publicity team. Thank you to my agent, Emily Forland, who um, is always there for me. Um, special thanks to Carlisle, Jesse David, who um, has given me so much love and support. And let me tell our story in this book. And finally, you know, the guiding principle for me of this book was something that my late partner, Oliver Sachs, said to me shortly before he died, something that is also in this book. And in this apartment, he looked up to me one night and said, the most we can do is to write creatively, critically, evocatively, intelligently about what it is like living in the world at this time. So that was my aim with how we live now. I hope I accomplished that. And I thank you so much for recognizing the book. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. <laughs> um, I think we're all in firm agreement that 2020 was like no other year in our book awards history um, and our own. So uh, thank you for that. Um, due to the pandemic, in fact, we were unable to hold the ceremony last year uh, for our 2019 winners. So we have prepared a video to include in tonight's ceremony, which I hope you will enjoy, uh, directly following remarks from our 2019 chair, Warren Wexler. Uh, Mr. Wexler. Good evening, and thank you all very much. Just before the pandemic struck, our jury, having read parts or all of almost 200 books, decided to honor five of them, their quality and range of subjects worthy of New York's wonders. 
books that give us poetry pulsing with uptown street speech, a mid 20th century college basketball scandal that disgraced struggling young athletes who were corrupted by gamblers and high city officials, the exquisite ornaments and grandeur of Central Park, a Staten Island as rich in human drama as Joyce's Dublin, and a glimpse of gay life in Brooklyn marked by distinguished artistic production and roiled by the waterfront's transformation and an expressway's construction. I had the privilege and pleasure of reading about all this with Bianca Calabresi, my superb successor as chair, Wynn Clevenger, Nikhail Iyengar, the late Karl Meyer, a citizen of literature and stalwart of the library who we sadly lost during his service, Christina Kent Randall, Kendall, Tracy Kwan, Stephen Raphael, and Gita Tawari. I salute them. Katie Frickus, our indispensable uh, coordinator, our supportive chief librarian, Carolyn Waters, my exemplary predecessor, Lucienne Block, the other dedicated jurors I sat with over six years, Jenny Lawrence for the Hornblower, and of course, Ellen Eisman, whose generosity and devotion to our city and the library have made this endeavor possible. Please unmute and applaud them all. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm so excited to be here to celebrate the New York Society Library Book Award winners from both 2019 and 2020. It's a true honor to be a part of such an exclusive group of authors who have helped to celebrate the history, uniqueness, and vitality of New York City. My book, The Central Park, is an untraditional look at New York history through the lens of the original architectural plans prepared for the building of Central Park. The drawings are part of the collection of the New York City Municipal Archive and provide an amazing link to the 19th century version of the city, much of which we can still see today in the park. As many are, this book was a true labor of love for me, and it marries my passions for history, art, and architecture into one celebration of the lungs of the city, Central Park. While I haven't read all of the books that are being honored here tonight, I have read several of them, and one thing that kept resonating with me was how they all offered some new and unique view of the city that has become my hometown. I would like to con congratulate all of the other authors here tonight and give a huge thank you to the Society Library for including the Central Park original designs for New York's greatest treasure in their, look, in their list of book award winners for 2019. To be included in the history of one of New York City's oldest cultural institutions is truly an honor. Thank you. Receiving a New York City Book Award from the Society Library was a huge honor, not only because I'm a longtime Brooklyn resident from Bronx parents, but because as a queer historian, it meant so much to see our history included as part of what matters about the history of New York. Places like the New York Society Library do so much for writers, for historians, and for all of us who value books and book culture. Hello. My name is Willie Peldomo, and I am the 2019-2020 New York City Book Award winner in poetry for a book titled The Crazy Bunch, which is a chronicle uh, of a weekend in the lives of five young black and Puerto Rican men from East Harlem, which used to be called Spanish Harlem, which is still called El Barrio uh, in New York City. And uh, over the course of this weekend, these young men experience joy, love, tragedy, loss. Um, it's really a culmination of memories of living in East Harlem um, condensed into a weekend in the lives of these young men. And it's more or less a coming of age story. And the book really started in 2014, I believe, with a question that was asked to me by a friend of mine who simply asked, when are you gonna write about us? 
And the question was answered with the following line. You remember that was the sum of up rock, quarter water, speed bumps, two for five, Jesus pieces and bamboo. The Willy Bobo was turned up to 10 and some would have said that the signs was dropped on our summer. It came out just like that, word for word. And the goal at that point was to maintain the vernacular, um, the syntax, the rhythm of that language throughout the entire book, which takes place in a particular place, in a particular time, amongst uh, a specific uh, group of people. Um, and New York City definitely plays a major, major role in the book because throughout the weekend, the young men go to a Sweet 16 in the South Bronx. They go to uh, a triple feature in Times Square, the old Times Square. And they all sort of reconvene back to the block as they usually do. Uh, but this particular weekend uh, is where a series of tragedies occurred that they will never forget. Um, it was an honor to receive uh, this award. I am a native New Yorker, born in Manhattan, raised in East Harlem. So to have an award with New York City as its focal point it's, is truly uh, 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 gratifying and uh, honor for me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to be receiving this award from the New York Society Library. Uh, before anything else, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, my publisher, Ballantine Books, and my wonderful editor there, Susanna Porter, and my agent, Henry Dunow, and of course, to my wife and kids, uh, who now know far more about college basketball circa 1949 than they have any good reason to know. Uh, the New York Society Library is, of course, one of the great uh, institutions in New York City. Another one is the City College of New York, and I was really privileged to be able to write about City College in this book. Uh, you know, for generations, City College has taken the brightest of New York City's high school students, uh, the children of immigrants and the poor, and provided them at no cost or very low cost, uh, really a stellar education. That was the, the mission of the school in 1950, the year that I was writing about. It was true in 1907, the year that that magnificent uptown campus was built. It's still the mission today, uh, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, I was writing in particular about this remarkable double championship uh, basketball team from the year 1950, a team comp composed entirely of black and Jewish players, uh, the children of uh, immigrants, the descendants of slaves who together achieved something really remarkable that had never been achieved before and has not been achieved uh, since New York really took them to their hearts. Um, and that story, the story of racial unity, the story of uh, civic virtue, the story of the triumph of the outsider is really uh, a big part, I think, of what n makes New York City such a unique and special place. Uh, it's a story that I think is just as relevant today uh, as it was then. Uh, I was really privileged to be able to write it and uh, I'm especially honored to be recognized by the New York Society Library. So thank you. Thank you again ever so much. I want to thank the New York Society Library for awarding my book, a New York City Book Award. Um, as a writer, you often hear about how exciting it is to publish your first book, but a lot of people don't tell you how terrifying it is. Um, so when I received this news while I was studying um, in Nebraska, I'm here in a PhD program, it was such a surprise and it brought such joy. Um, as a writer, you really care about, you know, what your home city thinks about your stories and to, to receive that recognition meant the world. Thank you so much again. Um, we were incredibly fortunate to work with some of our 
2019 winners over the past calendar year. If you've not yet seen Mr. Perdomo's presentation for the New York Society Library on the Crazy Bunch, which took place online last June, then I hope you'll check it out on our website. Um, likewise, we're also grateful to Mr. Ryan, who contributed a wonderful blog post also last June on recommended books for Pride Month. So a happy Pride, everyone, and to Miss Jimenez for teaching writing workshops at the library and to all of our 2019 winners and jury for joining us tonight. So thank you for that. <clears throat> I'd also uh, like to take a moment to thank the library's circulation staff at this time, um, who was instrumental during the pandemic in helping us to get books into our 2020 drawer's hands. So uh, we really appreciated the work that the circulation staff did to help us out this year. Um, so uh, circling back to 2020, if I may, I would let now like to turn your attention to Anita Kapadia, who will present our next 2020 award. Anita. Thank you, Katie. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight and to present this 2020 New York Book Award to Jonathan Daniel Wells for The Kidnapping Club, Wall Street, Slavery and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War. In considering this important book, I found myself thinking about the ways that Americans distracted themselves uh, during 2020, reading, knitting, uh, learning to bake bread, um, and I thought about the times when we couldn't distract ourselves, the moments we couldn't look away, and the things we couldn't unsee. The Kidnapping Club shows us something we cannot unsee. Um, jury members admired this book for many reasons, as an impressive work of scholarship, as an examination of the complicated intersection of capitalism, politics, and police corruption, as a gripping story about the incomprehensibly brave David Ruggles. And of course, it's a New York story, revealing the many forces and individuals who conspired cruelly in the early 19th century to fuel a growing city. And as the author tells us early on, it's not an easy tale to read. It's a brutal account of violence enacted against Black Americans by institutions and individuals, slavers, bankers, lawmakers, judges, and the police. It's a story of terror, of children snatched from their little deaths at school, of loved ones kidnapped minutes after they leave home, of panicked men and women searching the city for the disappeared. In bringing us always closer to the flesh and blood people who lived nearly two centuries ago, the author makes us see and confront the open wound of unresolved loss. In the face of long overdue recompense and too long delayed justice, I'm reluctant to call this book timely, but it arrived in a year when Americans were isolated at home and collectively witnessed the murder of black Americans by the police. And it's timely reading for the citizens of New York who I hope will consider the city's past as we contemplate its future. Northerners in the early 19th century wanted to think of slavery as a Southern problem. In The Kidnapping Club, we see what they might have pretended not to see, how our city was made, and by whom, and at what cost. Together with my fellow jury members, I'm honored to present this award and to introduce Jonathan Daniel Wells. Thank you so much for those uh, kind words, Anita, and thank you so much. Uh, for that uh, amazing encapsulation uh, of the book. Thank you, of course, to uh, the New York uh, Society Library and um, to Carolyn and Bianca and, and Sarah and Mrs. Eisman. Um, and I also wanna thank my editor, uh, Katie O'Donnell, who really helped me through some difficult um, sort of moments in the book. My agent, uh, my agents at uh, Writer's House. My wife, Heather Thompson, who is a, uh, a pretty respected historian who won the Pulitzer Prize for her book, uh, Blood in the Water, and who's, you know, long shaped uh, my understanding of American history. Next year, we will have been married 25 years, and um, I've loved every minute of it. And finally, uh, my in-laws, Frank and Ann Thompson, as well as uh, my own parents, Daniel and Elizabeth Wells. And of course, uh, our kids as well. I am honored and so humbled to be here with so many amazing uh, writers, Dr. Fernandez, and you know, so many you know, wonderful poets and photographers. Uh, I really am honored and humbled to receive this award. 
You know, um, as Anita suggested, the um, Kidnapping Club offers, you know, a pretty troubling account of pre-Civil War New York City. Uh, we have come accustomed, uh, I think quite rightly, to see New York today as this amazing multicultural, um, sort of pluralistic, politically progressive city, uh, which uh, many of us appreciate. On the other hand, it harbors a much bleaker, much darker history. And part of that is what I uh, try to reveal in, in this particular book, particularly the precarious nature of freedom for the city's black population in the years before the Civil War. But as um, Anita also mentioned, you know, as bleak and as, and as troubling as the story is, David Ruggles just sort of stands out as this amazing, tireless activist. In many ways, he sacrificed his own health uh, and well-being in pursuit of uh, justice and, and, and civil rights uh, against the police, against Tammany Hall and the Democratic Power, power structure, the legal system, the interests of Wall Street, basically the, the entire uh, city was arrayed against uh, the interests of people like David Ruggles. And yet he patrolled the, the uh, sort of Byzantine alleyways of lower Manhattan and uh, walked along the wharves and docks uh, uh, along the East River and the Hudson River and the Battery in search of uh, you know, stories or, or instances of racial injustice that he could try to counter. So, you know, I do think the Kidnapping Club is a history of long ago, but I do think it reminds us today uh, about the continued need for pursuing racial justice and the importance of ideas uh, like critical race theory, which has uh, you know, recently come under fire politically and intellectually um, from some, um, some, uh, some current actors in the country. And I, I do think critical race theory can help us understand the long national history uh, of legacy and slavery and racism um, in, this, in this country and remind us that America is a story about freedom and liberty for sure. Uh, but it's also very much uh, a, a history laden with the denial of freedom. And uh, I think the Kidnapping Club book, uh, I hope, makes that point. So thank you again to uh, all of the members of the jury, all the hard work you pin, put, put into reading all the books, and for this uh, amazing honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, John and Anita, a uh, beautiful introduction. So I am uh, Liz Robbins and I'm very excited to be here to present this award uh, to N.K. Jemison. And I have to say, this was the first book I ordered from Powell's during the pandemic, once my pile of books had, that I brought home from the Society Library had run out. And that purchase is the one reason why I happen to associate uh, 2020 with the city we became, but not the only reason. Like all of our choices that we have uh, spoken about tonight, this book was really emblematic of our surreal year. I could not stop thinking about it from the first page when it grabbed me like a tendril. Uh, a friend of mine gave me this uh, pen and I just have been waving it because it reminds me so much of, of the book. And so I, I use it as a bookmark as well. But anyway, uh, it really, this book did grab me. And I loved it because I'm a longtime reporter for the New York Times Metro section, formerly there. Uh, and I'm an author of my own book on New York City. And I'm also a really avid reader of science fiction. I recognize the scenes, the places, the people in this book. And everything in the city we became as familiar, even as it is so fantastical. Jemison retells the fragile existence and emergence of New York while creating a dystopian world that is really grounded in our present reality. There was refuge, but really no escape. I was shivering with recognition when I read an early scene nearly identical to the racist dog walker versus birder confrontation in Central Park last year. Jemison is known for her world building and I would go on to enjoy uh, the Broken Earth trilogy because of the city we became. But really I, I took so much refuge in this distorted reality. And 
of the city we became. And I raced on to see if this world that I knew and cared about would survive. And on second reading, because I had to go back again, I dove back into her richly drawn characters and her sardonic wit. She brings New York City to life in the avatars. Black, indigenous, immigrant, female, foreign, gay, Midwest transplant and native born. There's one that represents each borough and I don't wanna give it away, but there's a sixth one as well. And they're just so spot on. I can tell you from having reported in Brooklyn and Queens, Staten Island is really spot on. This book also was so much fun and it did what every great book does. It kept me awake until three in the morning. So I can say that the other books that we awarded also did the same. Uh, I will never be able to drive on the FDR the same way without looking over my shoulder or into the East River. I consider this book emblematic of our choices for 2020 because Jemison confronted the powerful issues that roiled and are still roiling our society in this year of upheaval, racial justice, climate change, social change, immigration, and the resilience overall of humanity. It's so fitting that she locates this all in New York and okay, New Jersey, uh, because it's a city as we have seen with its complicated legacies of liberty, of subjugation, ingenuity, cooperation, and ultimately survival. I know that Jemison has won so many prestigious awards, including the Hugo, the Nebula, the MacArthur, I just hope she will proudly add this humble award from the New York Society Library to her shelf. It's an honor from arguably the city's most dedicated book lovers and a committee made up of writers, teachers, lawyers, and discerning readers. We know a winner when we read one. So I am unfortunately not in Kay Jemison. Um, she was busy and couldn't be here and she uh, she really wanted to though. And uh, so I will keep my, my speech brief because no one wants to hear from the editor. Um, but, uh, but I remember the day the city we became first came out. It was in the middle of the pandemic and we were all so worn down and confused and scared. And, um, and when this book came out, all the reviews said pretty much, have I been muted this entire time? Oh my, no, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, um, so all the reviews said basically what you just said, that it was kind of the bomb that they needed and inspiration and, um, and a rallying cry. Um, it is fantasy, complete with parallel universes and tentacled Lovecraftian monsters, but like all excellent fantasy, it is rooted in the real. Um, in this case, the very real grit and magic of New York City itself. Uh, and that's what resonated with readers and I think with judges. Um, it's a book about how vibrant, uh, dark, dirty, powerful, and wonderful the city is. Uh, it's a celebration of all the best things about New York and New Yorkers, um, but also a rallying cry that we can all do better. Um, it's a call for us all to stand up against fascism, gentrification, bigotry, racism, um, police mm -hmm. brutality, uh, to stand up for the environment, all of those really vital, important things. Um, and, uh, and I'm so honored that you chose this for the award, and Nora is too, so thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nikhil Iyengar, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next award to James McBride for Deacon King Kong. James McBride is the author of the National Book Award winning Good Lord Bird. His numerous awards include a National Humanities Medal presented by President Obama, the American Music Theater's Stephen Sondheim Award, and the American Arts and Letters Richard Rogers Award. Deacon King Kong has won the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and the Ansfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction. E.M. Forster once wrote that the novel is unique amongst narrative art forms because nothing else can quite match its ability to utterly immerse us in another world. Deacon King Kong exemplifies this unique power of books. It is an incandescent, kinetic work of art. It carries forward the torch of great novels that are landmarks not only for what they are, but for what they remind us about how magical a novel can be, of the alchemy that take, can take place when words come together between the covers of a book. 
Deacon King Kong opens in Brooklyn, 1969, but our title character, a church deacon known as Sport Coat, marches into a plaza and, in public view, shoots a drug dealer at point blank range. This happens in the first paragraph, and we're instantly down the rabbit hole and transported to another world. Deacon King Kong is a very New York novel. It's set in New York, it's about New Yorkers, taking place in a very specific time and place, but it's also timeless and universal. It has the aura of a fable and views New York through a very special, magical lens. The characters, wonderfully brought to life, are as varied as the city they belong to, but they all share a common privilege of being chronicled in this novel with such grace, compassion, humor, and humanity. The prose shimmers and captivates and has a roving kaleidoscope view. A single sentence can whisk you away like a magic carpet through time, space, points of views, and lifetimes lived. There's a chapter from the point of view of ants, whose journey is as compelling as the steps trodden by any monarch of a romantic fable. There's a paragraph that begins with a baby throwing up on a pastor and then continues with a pastor becoming a blues singer who records a monster hit, but then sadly eventually dies in anonymity and flat broke, remembered, however, in college courses and idolized by other writers. A new life born and another lived, all in the space of 127 words. Deacon King Kong is a luminous addition to the tapestry of literature on New York City, and we are privileged tonight to award it a New York City Book Award. Well, um, those are a lot of fancy words there, and I, I truly appreciate them. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit intimidated because everybody's so smart, and everyone, you know, I don't know what to say. So I wrote, I, I wrote down my, my, um, my acceptance speech, and, and this is what I, I want to say. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. So, oh, wait a minute. That's, that's the lyrics to a song. I, I don't really know what to say. I'm I'm delighted, you know. <laughs> it's just one of those things. I mean, you know, you 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 you're standing in the room and God coughs and you happen to be the one with the handkerchief. Of course, you know, like everybody, I love I love New York, you know, I, um, and uh, I'm a, I'm a product of it. And uh, there are a lot of smart people in the city. It, it, nothing you do in writing counts unless you love somebody, really. That's really what it, that's really, that, that's all that counts. You know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't care about the rest of it. I don't care about the, you know, when Pete Hamill died, that was a man who loves people and his work reflected love, you know? So I, I'm, I'm very honored to be around so many, you know, really smart people who, who know what they're doing and, and, and can talk so well about things that I, don't know that I know that much about, but um, I, I do. I do love Brooklyn, and I love the little church where I grew up, and you know, little housing projects that houses it, and all of that. And it's all in the book. And uh, you know, let's stop talking and keep doing. It's nice to read. Reading's good, but we got to get up out of our seats and do. So I'm interested in people that do. I'm not interested in talking about solutions. I'm not interested in talking about problems. I like books that talk about solutions. And while Deacon King Kong is not a solution book, it does, it does try to prove that if we love each other and show courage that love inspires within us, good things will happen. So that's my little speech and I'm gonna stick by it. And now if you would just kindly click away from me so I don't have to stare at that little button and look like a moron, I would be very, very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're almost at the end of our ceremony tonight, um, but we do still have a very special award to present. Um, I'd like to thank Jenny Lawrence again for her support of our Hornblow Hornblower Award, which is a special award that uh, the New York City Book Awards jury gives every year to debut authors. I'd like to um, now introduce our 2020 juror, uh, Jesse Alvarez. Hello everyone, and congratulations to all our winners tonight. The ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, or El Ingenioso Hidalgo 
Caballero Don Quixote de la Mancha. I first read excerpts of Cervantes' book in high school. I thought the book was boring and old-fashioned. But then, back then, the book didn't make an impact on me, mainly because of the way it was presented. We were taught that Don Quixote was a masterpiece of European literature, inspired by Greek drama and comedy. We were not taught that Europeans owed a debt to the Arabic translations of those Greek authors, or that while Europe was experiencing its Renaissance, Aztec and Inca civilizations were being obliterated in the New World, and that Africans were being denied humanity to feed the growing slave labor market. 20 years later in grad school, I reread the book. This time it was a translation by Edith Grossman. In the second reading of the book, I didn't have to rely on a Eurocentric humanist lens. I had access to more diverse scholars, Franz Fanon and Gloria Anzaldúa, being two of my favorites. I reread the book from the point of view of me, of someone whose parents immigrated from Latin America, someone who is multiracial and who grew up in a working class family. This freedom to interpret the book from my own experiences made the book technicolor. The text was no longer black and white. In Kit Quijotes, a group of students, their teacher, and the one room school where everything is possible. Stephen Hoff writes about the after school program he developed and directs in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Still Waters in a Storm is a place where kids practice reading and writing in English, Spanish, and Latin. At Still Waters, there's one important rule. Everyone listens to everyone. Since 2016, the students have been collectively translating Don Quixote's adventures into English and adapting the Spanish tale into a bilingual musical. What if this had been my first experience reading Don Quixote? Just the radical notion of using Spanish, my first language, as a means for understanding this text blows my 49-year-old mind. Published along with Stephen Hoff's account is Becoming Kit Quixote, a true story of belonging in America by Sarah Sierra. We are first introduced to six-year-old Sarah in Stephen Hoff's book. There she tells the story of her mother's journey across the desert from Mexico, riding on the back of a tiger. In Becoming Kit Quixote, Sarah is a 10-year-old narrating with the help of Hoff, from her experiences at Stillwater. Sarah freely expresses the worries of a child of immigrant parents. So much of her story feels familiar to me. It's not often that I find myself engrossed by a book meant for a younger audience, but Sarah's imagination and her triumphs had me entranced. This once very shy little girl earns the leading role as Kate Quixote in the musical adaptation. Sarah's story reminded me how hard it is to make that first attempt to speak up and how rewarding it feels when you can sing your story out loud. Thank you, Stephen and Sarah, for sharing your stories and congratulations. Your books are the winners of this year's Hornblower Award for first book. Thank you very much for that introduction and thanks to the New York Society Library for this wonderful opportunity. Um, what it means is that some ideas that uh, and practices that have been happening in a one room schoolhouse in Bushwick um, can now travel farther and reach more people than they could have. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, a friend of mine called this a book that listens. Uh, it's made up of many stories, children and their families. And uh, in, in listening to them, you know, I, I used to as a teacher think that my job was to teach. And then I discovered actually that it's more of a, a, a relationship of, of exchanging knowledge. And uh, my most important job is to listen to the kids. And what I discovered, it, is that children are geniuses. And uh, 
when you recognize that, they flourish. And I also discovered that immigrants who have, are, have had such a hard time, especially in the last four or five years, uh, are uh, bring nothing but generosity and beauty to this country. And so I'd love for those ideas to travel far and wide. Um, I'd also, the model for the school is something I'd just love to have a conversation about with people in education and in other realms. Um, the idea that if you, you, know, you follow the old one room schoolhouse model and put together in a room, kids as young as five, all the way up to teenagers, college students, grad students, professors, professionals, everyone in the same room, sitting around the same table, working on the same project together, um, that actually the issues that trouble so many teachers in schools about behavior in class and uh, staying on task and all that, all, that's, all that vanishes. When you recreate what is essentially the, uh, our Stone Age ancestral uh, tribe, uh, everybody just feels that things are as they should be. And there's, there's enough peace and safety for people to really uh, thrive and express themselves. Um, so I'd love for that model to be widely known. And then, as you mentioned in your introduction, the idea that we repeat, and it's that's on our t-shirts and that's on the cover of the book, and is that uh, everyone listens to everyone. So usually in school, when kids are told to listen, it means they're, they're supposed to do as the teacher says. But if you radically agree that you're going to listen to each other in a mutual way, um, reciprocal uh, listening, um, it, it feels right inside and everybody's uh, efforts and intelligence are, are validated and, and you start everything from a position of humility, of saying that you are not, I am not as a teacher bringing knowledge to people who don't have knowledge. Uh, I'm part of a community, I'm part of a tribe. And uh, I'm thankful to them, to the kids and their families for having made me feel so welcome for the last 20, how much has it been? Like 25 years. Um, in, in my adopted home of Bushwick. Um, I also uh, would like uh, for the idea to travel that mental illness is not the end of your story. Uh, the book touches on my own uh, bipolar disorder and the idea that therapy can be an opportunity to tell your story and to revise your story. Um, and so storytelling for me, for the kids I work with, for their parents, all of that, the purpose of all of it is not to get good grades. It's not a diploma. It's mutual understanding. And I think that's a starting point for all that ails us in, in the world, not just in education, but in government and society, if you just keep repeating that, everyone listens to everyone, and then you think hard about what that implies and how to carry that out. Um, I really think that these books have something to offer. So thank you for helping to get those ideas uh, out into the world. I'm really thankful for that. And thanks to the kids and the families for all they've, all they've done to make it what it is. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I appreciate it for the introduction of the New York Society Library. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here since at first I was in Stillwater, the age of six. I was scared, nervous, frightened, basically just scared since I never really talked to anyone. I never even get the chance. Um, at school, I was scared to talk to anyone. I had no friends, but at the same time, I kind of felt um, like I was left out of everyone. But soon, Stillwater, as soon as I went in, um, 
when Stephen introduced the first rule, it was lis everyone listens to everyone. At first, I sort of was confused about it, but it was a whole crowded room with teenagers, kids, and different all ages of groups. I was scared, especially the adults and teenagers. For me, when I was little as a six-year-old, they seemed, for me, they seemed tough or something. But soon I finally realized they're actually friendly and nice. And when I rose my hand for the first time in still waters, I was actually surprised for myself, especially since I never really expected uh, myself to raise my hand or say anything in front of a whole crowd. I was scared, but soon years passed on. I got used to it and soon developed um, raising my hand in school, meeting people, making friends, um, enjoying life basically. And the story, the, the book that I wrote was based on my life and how my mom crossed the journey to Mexico to here and how she climbed a tiger and passed to here and jumped all the way here. She told me that she rode on the tiger and the tiger was able to speak to her and they went to journeys along. She told me that since I was a little girl and my mom didn't want me to learn all those immigration and bad things that's happening outside and don't want me to worry at all about what's happening outside. So she tried to keep me safe as possible. She wanted me to have a better life. And like, she didn't want me to suffer or struggle or try not to have an education. Since she was little, she always told me that she never went to school. She never even graduated. She never had enough money to travel or, um, bake or either um, have enough food at all and she added to work all day she added to farm she added to garden she added to help her mother and father out and she didn't want me to know basically the dark side of reality since it was a crucial cruel place but at the same time soon i grew older she told me and i ended up um, researching it for myself and well if finally realized that reality is not like a dream at all. But at the same time, it is, since you could enjoy life, since you only live once. Um, and when I researched about it, um, immigration, segregation, it was really hard back then. And the stuff that we're facing now is still happening. Um, especially racism that's going around in the world. And it's very cruel since many people have died based on police brutality and based on the color of their skin. I first, when I first realized about racism and segregation, I didn't quite like it at all. And I, and I try to ask questions to my mother and my father. I try to tell them what was the reason why people keep doing that and why, what was the purpose of doing it. And I didn't quite understand when I was little, but soon I just realized that it ended up being the answer of the color of your skin. And I didn't really like it since, I mean, we're all human and it's just the color, I mean. There's, for me, there's like no difference at all between all humans and um, their color of skin. But I mean, I feel like everyone should be equal. Yeah. Well, at this point, I want to ask everybody who's on our Zoom call here to unmute yourselves and give all of our winners, the 2019 and 2020 winners, a big round of applause.
Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I use Stephen's words to say that uh, you're all part of our tribe now. So I hope you will come and, um, and, and join us here at the library. Um, I also hope that you will all go out now and buy these fantastic books from our, uh, our favorite indie bookstore, the Corner Bookstore or your local uh, indie bookstore. And before we sign off for tonight, we're gonna close with a look back at all of the winning books from the past 25 years. So thanks again for joining us tonight and congratulations to all the winners. Mm -hmm.